Hi, I'm Polly Jean Harrison and we're here at Money 2020 in Las Vegas. Could you introduce yourself for us, please? Uh, morning, Polly. Uh, hi, my name is Vatsa Narasimha. I'm the CEO of Comply Advantage. I'm based out of New York, but the company is global and headquartered in London. Fantastic. And how are you finding the event so far? Amazing. I mean, uh, I, I, until I got here, I didn't realize how much I'd missed uh, being at events like this, meeting customers, meeting prospects. Uh, you know, we've sort of gotten used to this um, lockdown world where um, we l look at everyone in two dimension. And now you're here and you're having more meaningful conversations and uh, even the content, some of the sessions. Yesterday morning, the opening session with uh, Serena Williams talking about how she's thinking about investing in fintech. It's just eye-opening, phenomenal. G yeah. Great job to the organizers, uh, uh, great show, uh, one small vote. Uh, but it's, it's really been good so far. Absolutely, and I guess it must be almost a little bit more special for you since obviously you're newly CEO of Comply Advantage, so it's your first Money 2020 as CEO, but how, how is that going for you? It's been a few weeks now, right? It's been a few weeks, um, well, it's been great. But uh, to start out with, first and foremost, it's very humbling and it's extremely, I mean, the organization that uh, we've built, uh, I am proud of it every single day. And uh, while it's been a couple of weeks since the announcement, it really has been more of an evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. uh, I joined Comply about three years ago, um, and it's been really, I joined to team up with Charlie to scale the business. You've seen some amazing growth in the last couple of years, and uh, it still feels like day one, like 2020, as you said, like being here, uh, and in the last couple of weeks, I've visited our London office, our Singapore office, traveling around the world, meeting customers, understanding their needs, and looking at a global perspective of financial crime, right? Financial crime is one thing that's not localized. It's not like uh, any other sort of crime that could be local, jurisdictional, focused on a country. Financial crime is truly global. And part of what we are doing is really understanding what um, uh, global patterns are and how can we help um, explain that and present that to our customers and see how they can then help fight financial crime in their ecosystem. So it's been phenomenal, but as I keep saying, I think even when we did the town hall internally, uh, where Charlie and I were announcing this, um, our statement that Charlie and I talk about all the time, it still feels like day one. Like we've been on this journey for two and a half, three years, mm. still feels like day one and so much more to do. So very excited and uh, excited to be here to talk about this. Fantastic, and I think the, the, the idea of so much more to do is really interesting, because obviously, when it comes to financial <coughs> crime, there's, there's no respite, right? You know, there's, there's no stopping. Compliance teams are just tested daily to try and combat financial crime, but how is Comply Advantage making lives easier for them? Yeah, great question, and this is one you need to call time on, because <laughs> I can talk about it for hours. Uh, my team warns me about it all the time. Um, look, financial crime is only increasing. Right. It, 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 it is, I think, um, uh, there was some report uh, that I was reading the other day which said 70% um, of the businesses just in the U.S. have either experienced financial crime or have, have had an attempt made, uh, a financial crime attempt made against them. So, um, and compliance officers, they don't have an easy job. Um, we used to have a tagline inside internally at Comply Advantage that we call, not all superheroes wear capes. Compliance officers are that. Right? It's a difficult job, it's not easy, and in, in generally people don't come to you and say, hey, you did a good job stopping this. <laughs> people go, why didn't you stop it? That's right. when all the attention is focused on you. So um, how do we help? Many different ways, but I want to call out like three specific things. One is uh, with so much crime happening um, and uh, er things like sanctions uh, changing uh, on a real-time basis, uh, the real-time nature, real-time updates to identifying, stopping crime becomes so much more critical. So when the um, uh, Russia sanctions uh, actions started earlier in the year, um, we were able, to, like, there were so many updates to sanctions, and we were able to provide our clients with any list that got updated within 15 to 17 minutes. Wow. And, and you need that, yeah. because once someone is sanctioned, they know that they are sanctioned and they're going to try to find any avenue to make all their transactions happen until that avenue is closed down. So, and in fact, I think in the last five years, 
there's been like a 250% increase in number of sanctioned entities. It's a really large number to keep track of. So having a real time, um, not, not only real time um, um, uh, where how we collect our data, but we publish it. So there's a real time monitoring going on. And then it's a flexible and scalable platform. So clients can adopt it based on their use cases. So that's um, uh, uh, point number one on how we help our clients. The other one is as financial crime continues to happen, it gets more global, things are getting more digital. There are new risks that keep happening every day. And so we have built our entire platform on a knowledge graph that connects different entities and different data points. And so obviously, like financial crime doesn't happen with just one individual. It's not you or me doing something. It's usually a network that is associated. So how do we identify that network? It's easy to say, or, or somewhat easy to say, this person is sanctioned, so don't let that person on. But if that person's connected to 10 other people, how do you know who they're connected to? What are their linked risks? What are their network risks? We help definitely uncover that. We are at the forefront of that, and our product, uh, our data set, Comply Data, is uh, leading with that. And then last but not least, doesn't matter how much technology you have, you still need humans that understand behaviors, understand patterns. So we have a dedicated team of um, customer success managers who are compliance professionals and experts themselves, and they're located around the world, from Singapore to Romania to London to New York. So we almost have a follow the sun model to support our clients, understand their unique needs, one thing you'll hear every business executive talk about is, my business is unique. And, and that is true, right? And no truer when it comes to compliance and how you comply and how you fight financial crime. So we have dedicated customer success managers who are experts at recognizing some of these patterns and then use our technology and our tools and our data to help fine tune that to help uh, customize the solution for our customers. Fantastic, that all sounds incredible. But I guess when we're thinking about monitoring as well, mm -hmm. how can we increase the speed, but also the accuracy of that monitoring? Because it's, it's, it's all about time, isn't it? It's down to the minute, down it to the is, wire. It is. You know, a great point again. Um, I mean, I think um, fraud has been up, like fraud, it just again, the US, um, fraudulent transactions, fraudulent payment transactions, have been up like 66% year over year. Mm -hmm. And that is only gonna continue, right? One thing we learned in the, call it the COVID era, is um, more digital, more digital transactions, obviously more opportunities for fraud. So the two big ways that we think about this is, one is there has to be automation. And if you look at the last 10 years, across financial institutions of all size, uh, uh, the number of compliance professionals a number of eyeballs looking at transactions and things like that have been increasing. But that can't continue at the pace at which this is going. It's just not feasible. So automation, but automation in a way where, for example, you want to, you've identified a new fraud typology. You want to put a rule behind it to say any uh, transaction that trips this rule uh, is automatically identified. You need to have a way to be able to test that make sure it is doing the thing it is supposed to do and deploy it really quickly and monitor it. So that automation element is very key. The second element is use of AI. Um, it's just the volumes are so staggering now that if you don't use AI to help prioritize alerts, uh, to help identify patterns, human beings can do it, but the volumes are so high that using AI not to eliminate the human uh, human eye that is coming in there, but more as an assistance mm -hmm. to the compliance professionals that are doing that hard job at financial institutions is going to be absolutely key. I guess it's all about utilizing the resources that you have in front of you, right? Like it's not about taking away that human element, it's just no. making that human element more efficient in what they're doing. More, more efficient and more effective, yeah. right? It's about making sure that they are able to uh, my background's in electrical engineering, so I always talk about it as signal and noise. <laughs> it's about getting them to focus on the signal right. and not on the noise. So how do you um, uh, make, make sure that they are focusing their time and effort on the high-risk um, uh, instances, high-risk mm -hmm. transactions, 
and not uh, having sort of a unified approach across all transactions. Yeah, and I know you recently released um, a thesis paper with yeah. Resistant AI. I'd yeah. love to know a little bit more about that and some of the key takeaways from that uh, oh, report. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the number of uh, clients that contact us about how can we uh, detect better transactions, fraud better. Mm -hmm. um, it's and, and so we said, okay, uh, why don't we publish something as sort of what is our hypothesis on what's going on in the market? Um, and I think there were three main takeaways uh, from my perspective. One is it's no longer enough, like regulators are saying to every company, um, you can't say, oh, I didn't know this happened. I didn't know this could have happened. Mm -hmm. So there's almost a preemptive desire from not just regulators, even executives at companies are saying, hey, I don't want to be part of an organization that could have stopped something that if you just thought about it a little differently. Right. So that preemptive look at risk management, that need to say, look at all the data that you have, look at how can you identify the patterns, that is becoming very, very key. And um, honestly, with the harmonization of regulations around the world, this is sort of going to become table stakes everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the preemptive nature has been one. The second one is how um, AI has just advanced. So one big hurdle that has been there has been about, uh, with adoption of AI in financial institutions, has been about explainability. There's this term, as they say, oh, AI is black box. It's not so anymore. You can actually... Um, explain what is going on uh, very easily. And uh, you need to start to say, um, so that, that hurdle has gone away. And we talk a lot about giving examples of where AI has become very explainable. And obviously, uh, we are very proud of our technology. So um, uh, uh, clients will be able to easily understand that and also present it to regulators why they made mm -hmm. certain decisions the way they made it. And then last but not least, look, change is never easy, right? right? And so how do you, where do you start? Um, you can always say, oh, you're saying, lots of, um, put a big bang effort, put, bring in a ton of AI into decisioning every day. No, that's actually not what we're proposing. Our hypothesis is people can start small. Start with um, maybe one aspect of just understanding all the different alerts, how do you prioritize it, start with clustering some behavior patterns. There's a few baby steps you can take. And then as the organization gets comfortable with it, then you can keep adding and adding elements to it. And that also helps you understand your end customers' patterns, behaviors, and that way you're not doing um, big bang uh, change on day one, but you can do it, do it in baby steps. So uh, those are sort of our three big um, hypotheses or takeaways uh, for customers as they think about transaction fraud and how to implement more AI in it. Right, awesome. And I guess the million dollar question, I'm sure, is, is there an end to financial crime? Are we ever going to reach a point where we have, we've done it, we've beaten it, or do fintechs just need to keep evolving, keep catching well, up, uh, keep trying to stay one step ahead? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's technically billion or trillion yeah. dollar question. <laughs> um, so uh, the best estimates that we've seen just money laundering, right? Uh, not even including fraud, bribery, and stuff like that. Just money laundering is a two trillion dollar a year problem, mm -hmm. uh, and something less than one half of one percent of it gets uh, detected and things like that. So we have a long way to go. Um, uh, Charlie founded the company with the explicit goal of eliminating, f helping eliminate financial crime globally. Um, I think we're a long way away, right? uh, to be honest. The starting point is uh, yeah. solo. So um, yes, uh, there are two things I think um, every uh, company in the ecosystem has to do. One is uh, make it a commitment mm -hmm. that, uh, look, this is a priority, we're going to commit. Uh, and the way we run the organization is we say, yes, our aim is eventually elimination but our day-to-day -day goal is excellence. Mm -hmm. How do we do something better every day than we did something uh, the previous day? So that commitment is key, but then as you rightly said, there's to be innovation, there's to be that openness to adopt uh, new technology, uh, use more of the data that's available, more of that pattern recognition. I mean, um, crime has existed since the dawn of uh, humanity. And so how uh, and there's also innovation happening on the criminal side. So obviously to combat it, you have to have innovation happening on uh, 
the the good side of the fence and so people like us our clients uh, we are all having to innovate uh, it's just it's an interesting world um, no easy answers but I think um, you see green shoots everywhere in terms of how quickly uh, some of the new technology is getting adopted yeah. and uh, what that is helping stop and so I would love to sit here in a couple of years with you and say that the percentage that we're stopping globally has gone up uh, and uh, keep our fingers crossed we're all working towards that amazing well I look forward to that yeah. it's been fantastic to chat to you today thank yeah. you so much for joining us thank you thank you so much thank you thanks to your audience too